All rise, we are good. Please be seated. We are good as well. Um, good morning again. Mr. Nyang, you are on your legs. We'll continue with your um, opening speech, please. Thank you. Uh, merci. Thank you, Your Honour. I just finished speaking about what the hole was with this a whole reeking of feces and urine, and I'm going to continue with uh, the cell of uh, OCRB. Now, in the cell, in the OCRB cells, Your Honours, uh, the silica elements under the control of Mr. Said uh, detained people considered to be uh, loyal to Bozizé and also Christians, members of certain targeted uh, ethnic groups, such as the Gabaya, the Manja, or the Banda, or even military personnel, former members of the Central African Armed Forces, uh, uh, commonly known as the FACA, or the Presidential Guard, or people um, associated, affiliated with Bozizé in some way or the other. The statements of P2161, P2478, P2105, P1737 will demonstrate that Mr. Said had full authority at the OCRB, where he commanded the 35 to 60 Silica elements who were stationed there. At the time uh, the accused was in command, uh, he wore a military uniform, he had a military escort, and the Sudika elements called him Colonel, and this is how they would call him, Commander. He was also called the Chief or Director of the OCRB. Your Honours, on your screens, now you will see an official list of Sudika elements who were stationed at the OCRB in 2013. Now on this list, you will see that the accused is listed as n number one and his deputy and head of operations, Colonel Mohammed Tahir, is number two. Now, Mr. Said and uh, Mr. Tay were not the only ones involved in the crimes perpetrated in this structure called as the OCRB. According to the testament testimonies of uh, insider witnesses, uh, such as P0338, P2161, and P2563, a Salika called as Yaya Suman was also one of the subordinates and counsellors of uh, or advisors of Sage, just as he said Dembusha. Now, these men were members of the common plan as they also played a decisive role in the arrests and tortures inflicted in this uh, structure called as the OCRB. 
according to uh, P. O three three eight. You will hear a testimony from him. Yaya was uh, Said's most trusted ally. He would actually turn to him for anything. At the time of uh, the crimes committed, Mr. Said was. Uh, subordinate to Nordin Adam, who was reporting to Nordin Adam, he in ensured that the orders given by Adam as the Minister of Public Security was executed. Your Honours, we shall present evidence that arbitrary detentions and torture were ongoing continually that Adam provided funds for the Sidika in the OCRB to Mr. Said, and uh, that he organized meetings on site and received reports. Your Honours, at that time, Adam issued identification cards to Sidika members, as the prosecutor said in his opening statements, he issued ID cards to the Sidika members with his signature. Now, these cards bore the reference, as you can see, CMSAK, which is short for Colonel Mohammed Said Abdel. One of these cards obtained from the Sudika element, pay P1737, uh, is displayed on your screens. Your Honours, this card was issued in 2013 when the crimes were committed. And these cards were used to identify the Sidika elements. So, in fact, it was their eye cards, so to speak. Apart from Adam, Mr. Said regularly worked with other Sidika leaders who were also involved in the arrests and ill treatment of detainees at the OCRB in particular, and as you can see on the screen, General Fadul Al-Basha, who was the Deputy Director of the Extraordinary Committee for the Defense of Democratic Assets. The acronym is CDAD. You can also see the photo of General Adum Rakes, who was the deputy director of uh, the police. And lastly, you can also see in the circle General Mohammed Salet Adum Ket. Now, through insider witnesses such as P2105, P2 P2563, P0338 and P0787 and victim witnesses such as P0547 and P3056, the prosecution shall present evidence uh, that uh, these senior Sidika leaders whose photos you just saw and Mr. Said collaborated to imprison and uh, inflict ill treatment on the detainees at the OCRB. Now, this collaboration is further corroborated by the telephone data records, as I previously said. So over and above uh, the testimonies, we've got documentary evidence as well. So these are telephone co data records collected and they correspond to the telephone numbers assigned to Mr. Said. 
on your screens, you can uh, see your honors an extract of these call sequence tables drawn up from the raw data of telephone data records of witness P3108. The incoming and outgoing telephone calls corresponding to Mr. Said's mobile phone numbers show that during the period covered by the charges, he communicated with Nuruddin Adam on at least 101 occasions with Hissen Dambusha on 249 occasions at least and with Mr. Mohammed Salet on at least 133 occasions. Your Honours, police officers were also stationed at the OCRB facility. However, the presence and activities of Mr. Said and the Salika he commanded effectively uh, stripped them of any power. P0338 and P0787 that I referred to shortly a while ago would explain that the police officers had to follow Mr. Said's orders. The testimony you will hear will show that Mr. Said decided who was to be investigated and who was to be presented to the prosecutor. They were rarely informed by Adam or Mr. Said on the operations underway, nor did they have access to the prisoners held in the underground cell, the same cell that was beneath the foot, beneath the feet of the accused. The evidence shall also demonstrate that they fear the Salika of the OCRB in the performance of their duties. In other words, the police, in fact, uh, were stripped of their powers. Mr. Said's control of the OCRB lasted for four months uh, until the 30th of August 2013. This was when the Salika were removed from the OCRB following criticism and voices uh, raised in uh, both international and national media alike on their conduct towards detainees on site. Your Honours, on your screens, you can see the photo of the handover ceremony at the OCRB. You will see President Jatodia, the accused Mr. Said, Tahir, and other Salika leaders and dignitaries uh, who were present. And they've all been in a circle so that they can be identified. Your honors, I shall now address the crimes that were committed at the OCRB during the period when Mr. Said was in control of the detention center. I will then allow my colleague to talk about his individual criminal responsibility. Now, in the paragraphs 129 to 256 of the trial brief, the prosecution has set up the essential facts and evidence in uh, 
support of uh, counts one to seven that were already uh, listed by the prosecutor, and you're well aware of this. Between 12th of April, at least the 12th of April, and the day he left the OCRB, namely 30th of August 2013, Mr. Said, with the help of his deputies and his uh, close collaborators and other Sirica elements of the OCRB, arrested and detained alleged Bozizé supporters. These detainees were mostly men, Christians, and members of the ethnic group such as the Gabaya, Manja, or Banda, who were traditionally associated with the former President Bozizé. Others were targeted for having worked in his administration. Uh, Your Honours, I shall now turn to the subject of uh, the crime of imprisonment. The detainees, all civilians, were deprived of their liberty which constitutes the crime of imprisonment. The OCRB compound was uh, closed and guarded throughout their detention. They were under the control of the accused and could not leave the facility without his permission. The victims, in this case, were detained arbitrarily without prompt review of their case by an independent and impartial authority without consideration of whether their arrest and detention was required for imperative reasons of security or without any procedural safeguards. As the International Committee of the Red Cross has argued, the imperative reasons of security criterion must remain the minimum legal criterion governing the uh, internment of civilians. Uh, even if these detainees were to be considered interned under international humanitarian law, none, and I say none, of uh, the detainees' rights were respected. On the contrary, the deprivation of liberty was imposed arbitrarily and without prompt review of their case. The seriousness of the conduct was such that the fundamental rules of international law were violated. The arrests were arbitrary. Victims such as P1743 and P2263 were arrested. Why were they arrested? on the pretext that they were preparing a coup d'etat, whilst they had only picked up a political leaflet or held a sheet of paper in their hand, and that was enough to arrest them. Others were accused of being affiliated with Bozize because uh, of their family name, or perhaps they'd worked in his administration previously. The number of arrests and detentions increased in mid-August 2013 after the disruption of the inauguration ceremony of President Jatodia. Several men and one woman were arrested without clear evidence of the alleged responsibility for the disturbances. Uh, 
these arrests came as the second disarmament operation was taking place in Boyrabe, a neighborhood associated with uh, President Bozizé, who is uh, Gebaya and Sawari supporters. Uh, there was absolutely no review for on the basis of their detention and no procedural safeguards uh, were provided. So it was completely arbitrary. Detainees were entitled to a prompt, independent and impartial review of the lawfulness of their detention as, where, as, as well as other safeguards. Now, although the detainees were not always treated equally, they did uh, f uh, fall into two broad categories. On the one hand, you have uh, the ones who were treated in some way as if they were suspected or charged with a crime, but they were not given adequate rights. And then, on the other hand, uh, there were those who were apparently detained completely outside the law. Thus, while some detainees have been formally charged with crimes uh, after their initial detention, even though the charges were manifestly ill-founded, such as those detained following the leafletting events, as I mentioned shortly, and others have not been any afford, uh, have not been afforded any due process. The victims were held in conditions that can be described uh, without any exaggeration as deplorable. The cells were cramped and overcrowded. About 12 to 15 detainees were squeezed together in cells without windows where the air was stifling and there was only a bucket uh, which is to be used as a toilet. Mad um, your honours, witness PO622 will tell you, and I quote him, it was impossible to lie on the floor because the cell was full, end of quote. It was that horrible. And people were all cr scramped and squeezed uh, in that cell. So the uh, witness 622 will say that it was impossible to even lie on the floor. The evidence that we shall present will demonstrate that the detainees were f afraid. They were thirsty. They were hungry and could not sleep. They received little food or no food at all. Even water that was so important was very rare. And this rareness was pushed to such extremes that you will hear this witness, P622, um, who shall come, who will come here, and who will speak about what he had to endure. There was no water, and he will tell you that he was reduced to a situation where he was forced to drink his own urine. The prosecutor also talked to you about the underground cell under Mr. Said's office uh, 
and he used a very poignant metaphor that it was under his feet. Your honours, at the time of the charges, at least, and I say at least, 31 male detainees were placed in this underground cell, which was called the hole. The prosecution will get victims to appear who survived the extremely harsh conditions of detention and the ill treatment inflicted upon them in this hole. For instance, witness P3056 testified, and just to give you a slight peek, a sneak peek, I'm just going to quote his uh, testimony, and I'm quoting him. The basement cell was well, was a rather smelly place. It was about. Uh, four by four meters uh, with a very small opening in the wall. Around noon, we had a bit of light. But after 3 p.m., we were plunged into darkness. The first detainees had to put cardboard boxes and paper to make mounds on which they would lie down. Now, in front of these mounds, uh, at a distance of about two meters, uh, we would relieve ourselves. Just to say that they would either urinate or defecate. We lived with our excrement and urine. The inside of the cell reeked of a bad odor. There were cockroaches, lizards, and rats. So there you have it. This is what witness P3056 will tell you here in court, Your Honours. As you have seen from the video shown by the prosecutor, Your Honours, it was indeed a hole as described by the victims. There was no door to enter or to leave. As one witness said, there was not even a ladder or steps down. You had to jump down into this cell. During the time the victims were detained in the hole, access to it was limited, and some police officers will testify that they did not even know of its existence. The prosecution will call evidence from some who did know about this cell. For example, witness P2478, who in late August 2013, while carrying out her duties, this witness, a police officer, heard noises underneath the floor of Saeed's office where he worked. When the witness heard this, these noises, when the witness lifted the floorboards, she saw at least five prisoners in the hole. She will testify that she was afraid that these people would die 
for their hands and feet were tied, and their hands and feet had begun to swell. They were bleeding and looked like they had been tortured. Evidence will show that those arrested and detained were not always registered in a logbook kept by the Seleka at the OCRB. Witness P0547 will testify that no trace of his detention existed in the OCRB records, despite being detained in the hole for several days. Evidence will also be led that Commander Yaya, one of the co-perpetrators of the accused, instructed his men to tell the witness's relatives, witness P0547, that he was not detained at the OCRB and that he had been taken elsewhere. This is what they were to say when the relatives came looking for him. The deprivation of the detainee's rights, together with the inhumane detention conditions and the arbitrary nature of the arrests, Madam President, Your Honours, fulfill the elements of the crime against humanity of imprisonment. Pursuant to Article 7.1e, in some cases, the mistreatment, pain, and suffering inflicted on the detainees amounted to torture, cruel treatment, and outrages upon personal dignity. Madam President, Your Honours, I will now set out the evidence in support of the material facts of the crime of torture. Mr. Saeed and his subordinates subjected at least 16 male detainees to the torture method called the Arbatachar. In his presentation, Prosecutor Khan briefly described this method of torture and its effects. Since this is such an important part of the prosecution's case, your honors, Madam President, I'll have to hark back to this point for a few moments. This method consisted of tying the hands, elbows, and legs behind the person's back with their ankles tied to the elbows, thereby causing the body to arch in an extremely painful stress position. Here is an example of a man tied in this way, now visible on your screen. And to illustrate the effects of this torture, in addition to this photograph, I will share with you the words of one survivor, P0547. He will certainly appear before the court to give his testimony. This is what he told us. I was tied up so tightly that my legs were tired and my arms were paralyzed. I 
I again hurled insults at the Seleka men, telling them to kill me for once and for all and get it over with. So this gives you an idea of the intense pain and suffering that are caused by this torture method to such an extent that the person who is subjected to this torture would rather die than continue enduring such treatment. Madam President, Your Honours, you have seen these photographs of the witness, P0547. He was tied in this Arbatachar method. Detainees were tied in this method and also beaten in order to extort information or confessions. Another witness, P0481, will testify that he was arrested for conspiring, allegedly, with former President Bozizé in June 2013. The Seleka at the OCRB under Mr. Saeed's control forced him to drink three glasses of water directly one after another, tied his hands behind his back and made him lie on his back with the middle of his body propped up on a wooden plank. He was beaten on his bare stomach while stretched backwards. This lasted about 20 minutes. The Seleka then put burning nylon on his hands, from which he bears visible scars to this day. So not only the Arbachar method was used, but water was used. A few moments ago, I mentioned the complete deprivation of waters to such extent that some detainees had to drink their own urine. And in this case, water was provided in excess, another form of torture. Torture and all its infinite methods were explored thoroughly at the OCRB. Victims of Arbatchar will describe how they were unable to walk anymore, unable to use their limbs. Some were temporarily paralyzed. Others had discolored arms and could not even feed themselves. Others were so exhausted that they needed help to even change position and others suffered from infected wounds. The pain suffered did not stop at that moment. Witnesses will testify that the impact of the Arbatachar method remains to this very day as some of them are still unable to perform their daily normal activities and their suffering still haunts them. As victims will testify, the Arbatachar method carries severe risks to the life and health of victims, including suffocation, paralysis, 
and long-term trauma. Madam President, Your Honors, this method, the Arbachachar method, fulfills the elements of the crime against humanity and the war crime of torture pursuant to Articles 7.1.F and 8.2.C.I.4. Other forms of mistreatment rising to the level of torture were also used at the OCRB. including intensive beatings with whips and other instruments which led to bleeding wounds and, and the use of mock executions. Witness P1743 will testify about the severe beating he and 15 others received when they arrived at the OCRB in July 2013. They were beaten because some of them had picked up or photocopied flyers in the street calling for a peaceful protest or strike against the Seleka regime. The OS operation was called Ville Malte, Dead City. They were subjected to this merely for picking up political flyers in the street. P2263 a victim of the same abuse said the following and this information w lies at the very heart of the testimony that you will hear this is what P2263 told us we had to lie down and we had water and mud spread over our backs. Gravel from the ground was then added. I think it was done to make the pain worse. The Seleka then came with ropes, which are normally used to tie up cows. One Seleka at a time beat our backs with the rope. Another, I'm talking about the people who were, who were hitting, not the people receiving the blows. So when one became tired, another would take over. The order, according to the victim and witness P2263, the order was that everybody had to be whipped 20 times. They started again if anyone made a noise during the beating. During the beating, I wet myself. I know that one of the others defecated in his underwear during this beating. This is what you shall hear from witness P2263. The torture inflicted on victims at the OCRB was done with the specific purpose to inflict pain and suffering and to obtain information or confessions to punish, intimidate, or coerce the detained persons. Thus, 
the elements required for the crime of torture as a war crime are fulfilled, Your Honours, Madam President. The evidence at trial will demonstrate that at all material times, the detainees tortured were under the custody and control of the accused and OCRB Seleka, subordinates of Mr. Saeed. The prisoners held at the OCRB were, at minimum, hors de combat, or were civilians. Medical or religious personnel taking no active part in hostilities. The severe mistreatment, Madam President, Your Honours, the severe mistreatment described by the victims also fulfills the element of the war crime of cruel treatment pursuant to Article 82CI3. This corresponds to Count 4. In relation to outrages upon personal dignity, in addition, Apart from the extreme pain, the Arbatachar method puts the victim into a bodily position designed to humiliate and degrade the person, meeting the elements of the war crime of outrages upon personal dignity pursuant to Article 8 to C. I, I. A few words about other inhumane acts. The dire detention conditions and the lack of medical treatment, food or water in the cells at the OCRB also amount to the crime against humanity of other inhumane acts pursuant to Article 7.1k. As for persecution, the evidence will also demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt that the crime of persecution was committed by Mr. Saeed, Count 7. The evidence to be presented shows that individuals were targeted on the basis of their ethnicity, and on religious, political, and gender grounds. The victims were overwhelmingly from certain targeted ethnic groups, such as the Baya, the Manja, or the Banda. Victims were Christian. Victims were almost exclusively male. The victims were also targeted on political grounds as they were perceived as supporters of 
former President Bozizé. The intention, the discriminatory intent of Mr. Saeed, your honors, is established by the pattern of crimes committed against the victims, as well as verbal utterances by the OCRB Seleka, such as witness P0481 was called the big Bozizé supporter by General Nouradine Adam. P0547 is called a Bozizé mercenary by General Fadoul al-Bashar, while witness P3056 was interrogated about his alleged links with Ngai Koset and Bozizé. As you can see, Madam President, Your Honours, the evidence that will be presented in this trial will clearly establish beyond reasonable doubt that the crimes of imprisonment, torture, cruel treatment, other inhumane acts, outrageous upon personal dignity and persecution were committed against detainees at the OCRB. Madam President, Your Honours, I thank you for your patience and I will turn over to my colleague, Ms. Olomakwaya, senior trial lawyer, will continue and she will discuss individual criminal responsibility and she will be presenting in English. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Niang. Ms. McQuay, please. Good afternoon, Madam President, Your Honours. Thank you, Deputy Prosecutor Yang. I shall address you now with respect to the individual criminal responsibility of the accused Saeed at the OCRB. Madam President, the evidence will establish beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Saeed participated in the alleged crimes at the OCRB as a direct co-perpetrator under Article 25.3a. Your Honours, Mr. Mr. Saeed did not commit this, these crimes alone. Mr. Sha Mr. Saeed shared a common understanding or agreement with the members previously described by the Deputy Prosecutor and Prosecutor Khan. He committed these crimes in agreement with Nuruddin Adam, Colonel Mahmoud Tahir, Colonel Hissen Dambusha, Yayar, and we're portraying these images of these names on your screens at this present, Your Honours. Yaya Sumayele, General Mahamat Saleh, Adum Kete, General Adum Rakis, General Fadul Al-Bachar, and other OCRB Seleka elements to target, Your Honours, perceived Boziza supporters in Bangui by committing the crimes charged in counts one to seven. Your Honours, the prosecution will present evidence that there existed an agreement which was established through their regular mutual coordination on the commission of the crimes. At all times relevant to the charges, Mr. Saeed, the accused before you today, was in control of the OCRB. In this role, Madam President, Mr. Saeed ordered. Mr. Saeed oversaw the arrest, detention, and severe mistreatment of pro supporters or persons deemed to be affiliated to him. 
Your Honors, the accused exercised control over the commission of the crimes by virtue of his essential contributions to the common plan. The prosecutor will call at least 12 insider witnesses, Your Honor, witnesses with an inner knowledge of how these crimes were committed, witnesses with a perspective from within. These 12 insider witnesses, Your Honors, will lead evidence that will prove the different essential contributions to the crimes made by the accused. In addition, Your Honors, we shall also be calling several victims, several victims of the acts <coughs> of the accused, Mr. Said. These victims will describe to you his direct participation. They will describe to you the severe mistreatment, the severe inhumane conditions they went through at the RCRB. Their testimonial evidence, Your Honors, will be supported as initially indicated to you by documentary evidence, including release orders issued by Mr. Saeed himself. Your Honors, I will now list to you some of the, what we will prove were the essential contributions of the accused. You will hear evidence through the cause of this trial that he arrested, that he detained, perceived Bozizi supporters, that he detained these people at the OCRB. For example, Madam President, Your Honours, he, he arrested at least two soldiers, one at a football field, another at home at night. And these two individuals, Madam President, Your Honours, were later killed. The prosecution will also present evidence of at least nine victims which were detained by Mr. Said in the hall the basement that was under his office. You heard from Prosecutor Khan, you also heard from Deputy Prosecutor Nyang, the description, the horrendous nature of this hall. Madam President, Your Honors, you will hear evidence that Mr. Said controlled the underground cell, that Mr. Said not only knew that detainees were there, but he could smell them and he could hear them. You've heard this hall, this cell, was found immediately underneath his own office. He cannot tell you, Madam President, Your Honours, that he did not know of the existence or the detention of torture victims in this hall. It is the prosecution case that he participated in some of the interrogations, that he participated himself in some of the arrests and the detention of those persons held under the underground um, cell the hall. Madam President, he was fully aware at all times we submit of the inhumane detention conditions and the lack of due process of the prisoners, of the detainees held at the OCRB. Your Honours, as head of the OCRB, Mr. Said also had the power to arrest and release detainees. The evidence will demonstrate that some of these detainees were released after his instruction or authorizations. At times, he issued written instructions to do so. On your screens, Madam President, Your Honors, we present to you one such order. On this order, you will see, Madam President, you have the accused telephone number at the bottom. 753535, I think 23. That's his telephone number. Also, Madam President, you'll notice that this release order is signed Le Colonel. This was the rank that Mr. Said, the accused, was holding as he led and oversaw the RCRB during the relevant period. At the top, At the top again, you'll see Sur Lord du CMSAK. Deputy Prosecutor Nyang told you what that meant. Madam President, it is, it is our case. Not only did he have the power to arrest and detain, he also, when it suited him, he also issued release orders to some of the detainees. The next slide, Madam President, depicts another release order given at his instructions. As with the previous order, Madam President, 
you will note that these release orders were all issued in the year 2013 at the relevant time that Mr. Saeed was in charge of the OCRB at the time when Mr. Mr. Saeed was holding civilians, was holding prisoners, exclusively male at the OCRB. Another essential contribution that the accused Mr. Um, Saeed is being held responsible for is his use and his condoning, Madam President, his condoning of the Abatarcha torture method. Um, Deputy Prosecutor Nyang submitted to you at length about the impact of the Abatarcha torture. Mr. Prosecutor Khan also alluded to the Abatarcha tor torture method. We submit, Madam President, Your Honors, that not only did he use it, but the condoning of Mr. Saeed of this torture method was an essential contribution, an essential contribution of his to the common plan and agreement between himself and the co-perpetrators. You will hear from P0338, Madam President, that Mr. Saeed endorsed this method as the best way, as the best way to achieve confessions. You've heard the grueling, you've heard the impact the Arbatasha had on the persons on whom it was subjected. And yet, what did their accused Said tell his subordinates? What did their accused Said tell P0338? He told them it was the best method to achieve confessions. Madam President, his subordinate, Yaya, tied P0547 in the Arbatasha way. You hear this yourselves when this witness comes to testify before you. His subordinate, Yaya, tied P0547 in the Arbatasha way and hung him. He hung him from four posts at the OCRB. When this witness testify, your honors, you'll have the occasion to be presented um, with photographs of um, some of these um, areas where he was tortured. Mr. Saeed's essential contribution did not stop at torturing victims, your honors. He also supplied the Seleka elements or members at the OCRB with weapons. He supplied them with food. He supplied them with vehicles. He supplied them with uniforms. And as you've seen previously during the course of our presentation, he issued identification cards which were meant to identify and separate the Seleka from others. His essential contribution did not end here. It didn't end here. His essential contribution included the interrogation of victims using the most violent of manners at times. He did so with his subordinates Yaya and Tahir. He did so at the OCRB in order to elicit information from those perceived to be Bozize supporters or with affiliations to him. You'll hear evidence, your honors, that a witness was threatened by the accused at gunpoint. He was threatened with death as he interrogated him. Mr. Said's essential contribution also included the overseeing and the functioning of the OCRB. He directed the police officers stationed there and decided, your honors, who would be interrogated or sent to the prosecutor. He had the power to decide those who had no due to any legal or judicial recourse. He retained that power as the person in charge of the OCRB. The OCRB, Seleka under the control of Mr. Said, and the members of the common plan at all material times collaborate, collaborated closely with him in the commission of the crimes, and they also made co essential contributions within the framework of their common plan. Evidence will demonstrate that General Adam, Nuruddin, 
interrogated detainees at the OCRB. Colonel Tahir, Saeed's deputy, coordinated with him in the arrests and detention. In several instances, Madam President, your honors, General Saleh brought detainees to the OCRB who were perceived to be Bozizé supporters. General Rakis, Adam, and Saeed jointly arrested and detained a young baker because he was perceived to be a Bozizé supporter. General Al-Bashar arrested P0547 and Yaya oversaw his detention and tortured him at the OCRB. Madam President, these members of the common plan with the accused Saeed, such as Yaya and Tahir, executed his orders with regard to the detention of detainees held in the hall and elsewhere in the OCRB compound. You've heard from the deputy prosecutor and the prosecutor, and you've been shown images of the OCRB compound. You've seen the other cells above ground, G1 to 7, and you also shown the hall, the basement. In their common plan, as I've just stated, Yahya and Tahir executed his orders. Another member of the common plan, Dambushar, also coordinated with Saeed, the accused, on arrests and detentions and brought detainees to their OCRB. Their actions, Madam President, were closely coordinated in support of the common plan to arrest, detain, and mistreat perceived pro supporters at the OCRB. With respect to his intent and knowledge, Madam President, your honors, the prosecution's evidence will show that Mr. Saeed not only knew, but also intended, he also intended to contribute to the charged crimes. He was not a passive bystander. He intended to contribute to these crimes. He was present continuously at the OCRB during the relevant time, almost on a daily basis. The evidence to be led, Madam President, your honors, will demonstrate this. Further, Mr. Saeed was the most senior, the most senior and the most powerful Selica stationed at the OCRB. You will hear evidence of others who came and went, but he, he was the one who was stationed there. He gave orders and he managed the OCRB central detention facility. The evidence will also show that the underground cell was in his office and he ordered the detention of persons there. He also participated in arrests and physical mistreatment of prisoners himself. He coordinated and communicated on a regular basis with his Seleka elements who also mistreated uh, detainees. When it comes to his ordering and inducing, your honors, it is the pro prosecution case and we shall lead evidence to show that the accused conduct also fulfilled the elements of Article 25 3B of the statute. You will hear evidence that he ordered his subordinates to detain victims in the underground cell in inhumane condition. You will hear evidence that he gave instructions to detain victims in the above ground cells where he knew detention conditions were also inhumane. You will hear evidence that he supported and condoned the use of the avatar torture method by his subordinates. Madam President, the accused also provided incentives. He provided incentives to detain persons in an arbitral manner, including by enabling the extortion of relatives of victims. You've heard from Prosecutor Khan about this previously. He enabled the extortion of the relatives of victims who were detained there. For example, he exerted significant influence and provided incentive for arbitral arrests and detention, running an extortion scheme 
with another member of the common plan, Tahir. With your leave, Madam President, Your Honours, I will now turn to the contextual um, elements of the war crime. The war, the war crimes that took place in the Central African Republic between April and August 2013 occurred during the time that the accused was in charge, in charge of the OCRB. Throughout this period, an internal armed conflict was taking place in Central African Republic. This conflict, Madam President, Your Honours, started well before the charged crimes and continued for some months afterwards. In late 2012, Francois Bozizé, the then president of CAR, who had taken power through a coup 10 years early, earlier in March 2003, 2003, uh, let me take that up again. In late 2012, Francois Bozizé was the president of CAR. He had seized power by a coup 10, year, 10 years earlier in March 2003. Madam President, Your Honours, the belligerents, or one of the parties to the armed conflict, was a coalition of political factions and armed groups called the Seleka. Mr. Said, the accused, belonged to this group. He was a member of the Seleka coalition. Michel Jotodier and General Nuruddin Adam led this coalition. The other party to the armed conflict was a group of forces aligned with President Francois Bozizé, the pro-Bozizé forces. Over the course of the armed conflict, the pro-Bozizé forces would reactivate existing and new self-defense groups which evolved during the conflict into what then became known as the anti-Balaka. Leaders of the group included Francois Bozizé and members of his inner circle, such as Lévy Yaquete, Patrice Edouard Gaissona, Bernard Mokom, Maxime Mokom, and Olivier Coudemont. Your Honours, around August 2012, the Seleka rebel, the Seleka rebel coalition emerged in the northeast of the Central African Republic. This coalition was united by their dissatisfaction with Bozizé and his regime. This coalition was united in their desire to remove him from power. Madam President, at this point, we shall be showing you photographs, pictures of some of the Seleka armed group. These photographs, Madam President, were taken at the time when the Seleka was marching towards Bangui. From these photographs, you can see, Your Honours, that the Seleka elements and their leaders are armed with weapons. The Seleka elements and their leaders <coughs> are wearing military uniforms. The Seleka elements and their leaders possess vehicles which are mounted with military artillery weapons. In the next slide, Your Honours, is a photograph taken by a prosecution witness on the 18th of March, 2013, in Sibut, in Central African Republic. This was less than a week before the Seleka advanced on Bangui, the capital city of the Central African Republic. In this photograph, your honors, you can see Jotodia encircled, and Adam greeting Seleka elements. Six days later, 
six days after this photograph was taken, Your Honor. On the 24th of March, 2013, the Seleka had taken over Bangui. The Seleka had overthrown Bozize, who was forced into exile with his allies. The Seleka leader whose photograph we've just shown you, Michel Jotodia, then proclaimed himself the president of the Central African Republic. Madam President, Your Honors, the Seleka's assault on Bangui demonstrated their military ability and capability. Their assault forced Bozize and his allies to retreat. This resulted in a temporary lull in the intense clashes, but it did not end the war. One may ask, was there a peaceful settlement to the hostilities? No, there was not. Was there a lasting absence of armed confrontations between the parties? No, there was not. Was there a real risk that serious fighting would resume? Yes, there was. Something, Madam President, Your Honors, something that both parties to the conflict understood fully well. After the taking of Bangui, the Seleka set up a transitional government under Jotodia. Through decrees, they appointed key members of the Seleka coalition to important positions. We're now portraying to you some of these decrees. I'm, I'm not sure how you can, are they clear? Mm -hmm. Can you zoom them a bit? Okay. Some of the decrees that were issued by Jototia and his regime. Your honors, state entities were taken over and other bodies were created. For instance, a National Security Council whose members included Nuruddin Adam, and the council's president was presided by Jotodia. You have before you, Madam President, a list of ministries and the individuals who were appointed to these positions when the Seleka took power. When the Seleka took over the government ministries and established bases in Bangui, headed by senior Seleka, com Seleka commanders, such as at Camp Bill, Sapeur de Pompier, and Camp Deru. You'll hear evidence, Madam President, your honors, that these commanders engaged in a system of lateral coordination and cooperation in order to achieve the common goal of maintaining power. Mr. Saeed was one such commander who was set up and established at the OCRB base. You will further hear evidence, Madam President, that prisoners were transferred between these bases that the Seleka was controlling. And a system of food distribution was also established where they shared some of the food. You will also hear evidence, Madam President, that during this period, the Seleka controlled important territory in the Central African Republic. Your honors, this included the capital city, Bangui. They also set up a system of checks points to monitor and control the movement of people. The Seleka set up checkpoints across the Central African Republic to monitor and control the movement of people. To maintain its power and control, it also put generals 
generals, Madam President, in charge of different regions in Central Africa. When the Seleka took over Bangui, they reportedly had about 5,000 fighters. 5,000 fighters. But by the end of 2013, they had around 15,000 to 20,000 fighters. This, your honors, demonstrates their ability to successfully recruit en masse members to their coalition. When Jotodia took power, when he proclaimed himself president, he set up his base at Camp de Roux and created his own presidential security guards. He appointed its leaders by decree. With these men, he was able to assert his power and establish his rule. The other belligerents to this conflict, Madam President, your honors, the other members to the conflict, Bozize and his allies quickly set about regrouping their fighters by supporting, by training, and consolidating self-defense groups with one aim, the aim of forcing their way back to power. At this point, they maintained an effective command structure. The evidence will also, sh will also show or demonstrate that a substantial number of experienced fighters remained loyal to Francois Bozis. These yarners included <coughs> former members of the Central African Armed Forces, known as the FACA, and former members of Bozizé's Presidential Guards. While the Seleka's takeover of Bangui had forced most of these fighters out of Bangui, the evidence will show they withdrew in fairly good order. They had the time and strength to hide or carry away military stockpiles. These, your honors, included state purchased weapons and ammunition. For example, witness P2328, who was a member of an official mission sent to neighboring countries by the Central African government at the time, will give evidence that many of the weapons taken by pro Boziza forces were later retrieved in the neighboring countries. You will also hear evidence, Madam President, your honors, that many pro Bozize fighters retreated and gathered on the border regions of Central African Republic, biding their time to launch a counter attack. This does not mean to say that all the loyal forces to Bozize fled Central Africa your honors. Some, you will hear evidence, remained in, in the Central African Republic and continued to display signs of armed resistance to the Seleka. Madam President, your honors, I would now like to direct your attention to a map which should be showing on your screens. On this map, you can see Bangui, it's appearing now in red. It sits right on the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo to the right. Your honors, many pro Bozize fighter, fighters retreated across the Ubangi River to the Democratic Republic of Congo to a town called Zongo, also now shown on the map before you. Other fighters 
pulled back to the areas on the border with Cameroon. They got gathered in places like Bertua or Garua Bulai. Both places are now also showing on the map before you, Madam President, Your Honours. These locations were strategically chosen. Why? They were strategically chosen because they were near the major supply route from Cameroon to Bangui, which you will hear evidence, Madam President, Your Honours, was a crucial where the crucial road as food and other essentials were transported on this road. Your Honours, within weeks of leaving Bangui, Bozize held high-level meetings to plan his way back to power. Bozize's associates liaised with pre-existing self-defense groups and new recruits to organize, arm, and train them. By June 2013, structured military trainings overseen by former FACA members were taking place in locations such as Zongo and Kala, Kalangoai in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Both locations, Zongo and Kalangoai, are also now displayed on the screen, Madam President, Your Honours, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and in Gobere within the Central African Republic itself. All these locations are now displayed before you. Your Honours will hear evidence from P1339, an anti-Balaka insider who received trainings by a pro Bozizer member called Alfred Yekatom in Kalangoi. Um, um, Madam Prosecutor. Oh, yes. apologies, Madam President. That's I okay. Um, I think this is a good um, place to stop so we can go for lunch. But uh, may I ask um, how much more time you think you still need when we come back? I hope to be done in 45 minutes. Madam 45 President. minutes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I think I'll um, adjourn the case till we come back at 2.30, please. All right. We will.